Our speaker this morning has pioneered literally the career of teaching and for all his work that he has done in Toronto, uh, he co-founded the Center of Excellence in Education and Practice and this center now bears his name, Dr. Hilbert Hope P. Carlin, Center of Excellence. Now I had the pleasure of listening to Dr. Hope as a keynote speaker at one of our medical alumni meetings several years ago in Jamaica. We are very pleased of this UWI graduate who has taken our clinical excellence of what he has learned in Mona to higher heights. To that, he has been also awarded the Art of Jamaica. So I'm very pleased this morning that we have among us uh, to give a talk to us, Dr. Hopi. Come. Dr. Come. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roberts. And I just like to bring you greetings from Toronto, Canada. There, in fact, is a great deal of connection between Canada and the Caribbean. It goes back uh, a couple of centuries ago uh, when John Cabot uh, sailed into Bonavista Bay in Newfoundland and he dropped his pail over the side of his boat and pulled up a bucket full of cod. Some people tell me it's the same bucket they use for the urinal. <laughs> but in fact, uh, that's not true. And of course, the cod uh, was so plentiful that it was salt dried, salted, and sent in great big barrels and ships down to the Caribbean. Bahamas included, Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados, Antigua. And that was good, but there's a downside to that. So when the cod was salted, produced hypertension in Jamaica, in Bahamas, Barbados, and Trinidad. What kind of hypertension? Malignant hypertension, a gift from Canada. But of course, this is a reciprocal arrangement. So in Jamaica, there's sugar cane, like in Bahamas. So we made rum, and we sent rum called Screech Newfoundland. So we said, OK, we'll take this malignant hypertension, but you Canadians in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia and Ontario, you take cirrhosis <laughs> with esophageal viruses, bleeding, etc. So that's a greeting from Canada. I think that presently, of course, something like 2 million visitors from uh, North America visit Jamaica each year. I understand 5 million to the Bahamas. So that integration continues and in that relationship. Very pleased to be talking to the students today. I'm going to give two talks this morning and then at 12.30. At 12 and I'm going to speak from a background of my own experiences. So this kind of lecture is meant not only to let you know what I think the future of medicine should be, and could be, but also how my own experiences has flavored my sort of judgment and the way I think about medicine today. So let me take you back to when I was a medical student. But even before that, I actually uh, was thinking of going to America to do medicine. And my headmaster, Father McMullen, he's a Jesuit from New, from New England. Uh, and he said to me, um, but Hope Ping Kong, you remember that first day you came to school? I said, yeah, that was six years ago. I was in short pants then, sir. I approached you and there was a thousand students at assembly and 999 left. I was the only student standing up. So my name was Herbert Ho, H-O. So he had his long list and I said, sir, I'm here, I paid my fees. Time for me to you know, join the, the other students going to classes. He said, no, I don't have any Herbert Ho. So he looked at his list, he said, I, I have a Herbert Kong. I said, no, sir, that's not me. So he said to me, what's your father's name? I said, it's Ho Ping Kong, sir. He said, son, your name is too short. 
from now on, your whole being calm. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why, why I'm here. So I went to U University of the West Indies. Uh, he told me not to go to the United States. So having changed my name so dramatically, I had to follow his advice. So he, he made a really great choice for me. He said, we have a new medical school coming up. It's, uh, it's going to be um, run by the British. I've met them, and I have every confidence in what's happening. And I think there are a couple of uh, UCW, University College of the West Indies people here, including myself. My wife, Dr. Barbara, is here. She graduated four years after me, but she got a University of the West Indies degree, but I have this London degree. Anyway, so I, I did my, um, my medicine. I was, I was okay the first three years, but during clinics now, uh, I was a really good clinical student because I read for about three, 30 hours per week, in addition to spending hours in the ward just listening to mitral stenosis. You still have mitral stenosis here? Yes, occasionally. So there's loud first sound, pre-systolic accentuation, mid-diastolic rumble. Uh, so I remember one day, I was sort of crouching in the background at one of these big rounds that Dr. Shear and Dr. Hunt would take you around. So I was just watching what the residents were doing with the consultants. The professor of cardiology. Uh, oh, I see you lurking there. What are you doing there? I said, I'm only a 40-year student, sir. He said, oh, you come here then. Come on, let's go. I want you to listen to this heart. So I listened. And I took about 30 seconds. I said, yes, sir, there is an early diastolic murmur. He said, what's your name? I said, Hope Pinkham, sir. He said, uh, listen again. So I listened again. And it indeed was an early diastolic murmur. It's one over six, sir. It's very soft. This patient probably has aortic incompetence. He says, you know, Hope, Hope Pinkham, if this was finals, I'll fail you. I said, no, it's not finals, sir. But I think I'm right. And then up stepped Dr. Rolf Richards. At the time, he was a registrar, trained in, in England. And he came down, put his stethoscope down, and he said, you know, sir, I think the student is right. <laughs> this is aortic incompetence. Uh, yes, sir, I heard it. I listened to it all night last night, sir. He said, you know, you might be right this time, but if it was finals, I would still fail you. Anyway, <laughs> for the students, I think, uh, it's one, one for you guys. I'm going to talk to you today about a subject that has been dear to my heart for a long time, for 50 years. It is about what is it to be a doctor? Are we technicians? Are we scientists? Are we humanitarians? What do we do? It's very important nowadays because if you look at what has happened between when you guys, when I entered medicine at your age, meaning I was probably a third or fourth year clerk by then, things have changed so dramatically. We have great advance in technology. There's laparoscopic surgery. We no longer get these big, long 12-inch uh, you know, incision, even for colon, for, for colon cancer. We now know what cause hepatitis B. 1970, I was in Edinburgh going for a welcome fellowship, trying to be a nephrologist. So I was in London when um, Hudson Phillips, a good friend of mine from Trinidad, called and said, look, I hope you're not coming to Edinburgh. I said, yes, I am. I've got my welcome fellowship. He said there's a hepatitis B epidemic at the unit. I said, yeah, so what? He said, well, people are dying. So there are four deaths from uh, doctors and nurses. One struck himself with a needle, and the other one uh, had a splash of blood in her, in her eyes, a nurse. So it was closed. And because I was from the Caribbean and I had a history of hepatitis A at the time, I was not allowed to go into that program. Of course, look back today, hepatitis B, disease is completely different. Even hepatitis C is cured with, with new drugs. Looks what happened to cardiac surgery. Arthur Weinberg, Montreal. 
He actually anasked Mose, one, one of the internal mammary artery to coronary artery and called that cardiac surgery. It wasn't a great operation. Dr. Willie will tell you that's, that's a, a dumb thing to have done. Even though we sometimes still do this operation, it was the precursor of what cardiac surgery is going to be. You move forward to today, what's happening? We're talking about personalized medicine. What it is that your genes are telling us that we need to know to give you a specific treatment for a specific disease. If you have a long resection today, it's been done by video assisted technology. So this is great advances. Our average uh, age, lifelong span go to, uh, in my days, was 60. If you were 60 years old, you wouldn't get into the intensive care unit at the University of West Indies. Nowadays, age in North America is up to 82 for men, 84 for women. So despite this great advance in technology, our cure for some leukemias, cure for some cancers, uh, new therapies for, for heart disease, great advances in, the, in lung surgery, laparoscopic surgery, there remains part of medicine <coughs> that has to be done by a human being. And for a long time, I, I've thought about that. And I sort of practiced my, uh, built my practice to, to try and, and live up to those standards. So how did I come to that conclusion? So I look back and said, you know, the people who were my heroes were people like uh, Sir William Osler, I had a great pleasure last year of being the Osler Professor of Expert Medical Practice at University Health Network for a year. So I sort of understood what it meant to be. But Osler was probably the most influential person in my life. He was at a time, 20 years previously when I was at, medical, at your stage as a medical student, he was a Nuffield Professor of, uh, of Medicine at Oxford University. But you know where Osler was born? He was born in... Canada, 20 miles from Toronto, a place called Bonhead. He spent two years of medical school in, um, in Toronto and then moved to McGill. And he made his name at McGill as a great pathologist and internal medicine specialist. He moved to uh, Johns Hopkins University and started the Osler Wards at the time and eventually to Oxford. So he was one of my great heroes. So we'll talk a little bit about him today. But of course, when I went to medicine, there were physicians who you could model yourself after. There was Dr. Ronald Irvin, internal medicine physician who trained in Britain, who came back, was a tremendous diastitian. I used to watch him sit by the bed and examine his spleen and said, you know, the spleen is so large. It, it's reaching to the umbilicus. This is really what we call massive spinal And I'm listening, and he said, you know, She's been having this for six months. She's going to have chronic myelofibrosis. And I'm saying, myelofibrosis? How could you say that, sir? Because he said, this is what she has. And you know something? This is what she had. And of course, I had John uh, Cruikshank, who was the chief of medicine from Glasgow, steely blue eyed. He looked at you, you start melting. Oh, my goodness. I know you got a feeling, you know, I'm sweating away, and he's looking at me. But he was also a great teacher. So I sort of modeled myself after those, those uh, great teachers. Uh, and eventually, uh, I uh, finished my, my schooling in, um, in Britain, went back home for two years in the University of West Indies. And uh, from then, I went to McGill. So that's the start of what I, I finished, sort of well, how I, I got to be here in my second talk. But my first talk today is going to be on the art of medicine. So what do I mean by the art of medicine? I hinted at you what technology can do and has done for us. But I believe, and I think I'm not the only one here, that technology is not sufficient to be a physician in the year 2017. You can be the greatest uh, surgeon, urologist, general surgeon, etc. But you need to be a doctor first. Of course, when, when you say 
Look at a psychiatrist. What technology do psychiatrists have? Very few. They may do deep brain stimulation for severe, severe depression, or maybe a neurologist. But they have very few chance of curing somebody. So what do they do? They try the best to cure. And if you cannot cure, you look at caring about patients. Right? I had to move this thing forward. So you talk about the art of medicine. The art of medicine comprises a group of uh, subjects, include being able to see, to listen, to palpate, to communicate, to have empathy, adv advocacy, to think outside the box when things are not going the way you predict that they should go. You have to deal with uncertainty. There's no diagnosis, no treatment that is specific. You care, but you just still need to give some treatment. What do you do then? And of course, there are rare diseases, sometimes one never seen before. And of course, there are epidemics. <coughs> Recently, chikungunya, Ebola, SARS in my days. At the center of this list is communication, empathy, and advocacy. Let me just give you a little story here about, uh, and as you think about this, just say to yourself as I go along, what's the diagnosis? What's going to happen to this patient? So this 50-year-old Cambodian man comes with a deep vein thrombosis in his left leg. Not a big problem. You want to coagulate him with heparin, and then you give, uh, then give coumadin or warfarin. Two weeks later, he comes back. He's got another deep vein thrombosis. So you increase the amount of coumadin you give. Your INR goes from being 1.5 to 2.5. Then six weeks later, he has a third deep vein thrombosis. So according to St. Thomas's Hospital in London, there are 60 cases of uh, tough to, you know, to treat uh, deep vein thrombosis. You need to go higher with the INR. And you know the number, 3.5, according to Jack Hurst from Hamilton. I'm giving you evidence-based medicine as I go along, sort of quietly and sort of, uh, you know, sneakily. But that's how it works. And of course, you need to try to know why this man has deep pain thrombosis. In my days, when I was like you, we didn't have to do anything. You know why? There was no test for that. Everybody was idiopathic. So we did this test and the antiphosphatase antibody was positive. Got it? And the other things that you, you need to know about is that uh, when you got DVT and there's a cause, it's going to be factor five laden, almost it's a neuro, et cetera. But this guy, this person had antiphosphate antibody. So INR is three point, and then at the eight week, he had a foot deep vein thrombosis. And of course, the big worry, when is he gonna have a pulmonary embolus? So we had to switch him then to heparin. At the time, we were lucky that low molecular weight heparin was becoming available. So we switched him. The cost of this is, I'm in the Bahamas, correct? So you've got to pay for everything here, right? <laughs> was $12,000 per year. This guy was a chef. He didn't want to go on to Medicare, meaning the public, public sort of a free drugs system. So he said, okay. He started to reduce his heparin. Instead of twice a day, once a day, then three times. And of course, developed this great big ulcer covering his entire leg. It was so bad that the first person who saw him surgery said to him, we may have to amputate your leg, sir. Of course, that wasn't, it wasn't really needed. So I asked him, you know, why did you stop this you know, um, heparin? He said, I couldn't afford it. My chef's salary only provides for half of that. So I said, okay. So I spoke to my chief resident, and we walked to Aventis, Canada. And we explained to them that here's a man who does not want to go to the public purse. He wants to keep working. Can you provide this medication for him? And here's something they did. And for 20, 15 years, every three months, we get a supply of low molecular heparin 
the cost of that's four thousand dollars each time for this gentleman. So he comes in and uh, gets his medication. And the reason why I'm telling you this story is because instead of what empathy, which I just described, we felt compassion for this gentleman. We thought, look, you know, not only compassion, but what can we do to help you become an advocate? So when the students come to, he, he volunteered to come to my clinic on Fridays, whenever I needed him, and I would say to the student, on the day that this medic, I would save it, I'd say, look, when he, I want you to do me this favor. Can you give this box of low medical weight heparin to this patient? And the student would go and, and you know something? There were tears in my office when that happens. I said, why are you crying? You're, you're a big man, like you, for example. He says, doctor, this is what I always thought a doctor should be doing. And when I graduate and become a pediatrician, I'm going to go to Halifax, I want to be able to do that. So that's advocacy. But let's get back to something that's more um, theoretical. What, what is seeing? To me, seeing is not the right. It should be looking. Because looking is an active process. If you look long enough, you become so expert that once you s it's there, one look, and you can see it. Same thing with, with listening. You could say, we can hear something. But when you listen to something, you're saying to yourself, how loud is this thing? Where is it? What does it sound like? Where is it going? Like the mattress, you know, it's like the aortic incompetence murmur. It's a soft, blowing, diastolic murmur. It's early, it starts with a second sound, and there may be a mid diastolic -like rumble. And that's an active process. And the same thing with palpation, it's not feeling something. You're saying you feel this, and it, what, is, it, uh, is it hard, is it soft? What's the size? What's the relationship to the surrounding? Is there limb nodes available? So these, these are really active processes. So let's get back to uh, William Osler. Here's a quote from him. The whole art of medicine is observation. But to educate the eyes to see, the ear to hear, and the fingers to feel make, takes time. And to make a beginning, to start a man on the right path is all that you can do, so that's Osler. So here's another case for you. And, um, my recommendation to you, to the students especially, is that when you leave here today, you have a little note and you can go read the stuff in your, we're going to be in, uh, in Harrison's textbook or Davidson's or wherever you go. So this young woman is 29 years old. She's had to have rheumatoid arthritis, treated with Plaquenil, which is an anti-malarial, uh, shilocytes for six months. And, uh, <laughs> Nobody's first or second year here, right? You're all third year and beyond. So I don't have to explain what ascites is. But if you wanted to listen, you say, oh, ascites, well, what's the commonest thing I've seen? My guess would be, could be cancer, or it could be cirrhosis, just like my friends from Buena Vista Bay in Newfoundland, or it could be something else. So she had a site, it was a common problem. She saw about six, seven, eight different people including doing an echocardiogram, no answer. And this is what she looked like. She actually gave me permission to, to show these pictures. Uh, she said that you need to do this so that we can make sure next, I don't have to wait two years or six months to make the diagnosis. So you can see right here that there's a, right there, it's an everted umbilicus, and that's a classical sign of, um, of having raised intra-abdominal pressure. A lot of you are thinking, and maybe she's pregnant. And of course, being a smart woman, she went uh, to the pharmacy and she did three pregnancy tests, all negative. So the question, what was this cause of the ascites? Okay, let's go here again. So here's a nice picture. She's smiling because she already had the diagnosis, and I said, look, we're going to cure you for this. 
But I'm pointing to the drug to the Venus pressure. Remember, this is all about this. not only seeing, but looking. A lot of you will look at the JVP from the right side. For some reason, maybe because of my British heritage, I always look on the left side. So I went to the left side, and everybody said before, our drug to Venus pressure was normal. In fact, this patient had a very elevated drug to Venus pressure, almost up to her ear roll. If she had ear earrings on, the earrings would be moving. Good to wear earrings. For me, anyway, I can see the drug venous pressure better. Right? So what's wrong? Raised drug venous pressure is a very common physical finding. You can watch the V wave and a steep descent if you got tricuspid regurgitation. I'm, I'm going to give you that hint so you don't have to read them about, about tricuspid regurgitation. In fact, this patient did not have any peripheral edema. There's no edema of her legs. None of her sacrum either. So it can be an unusual case. So the reason, reason why I'm talking to you this morning about this particular case is that I'd seen this problem 40 years before when I was a medical student at the University College of the West Indies. And this patient had constrictive pericarditis. So this is a case for my lifetime of 50 years, two cases. And I'm expected, after seeing one case 40 years before, to make the diagnosis 40 years later. So I saw this young, lady, young woman. And uh, it took me about 10 seconds. Of course, you have a resident who actually presents history and so on. I said, look. And the question to me was, but she had an echocardiogram. They were said to be normal. And I said, you know something? At the time, I didn't have my list of uh, the uh, actual uh, uh, subjects that make up the art of medicine. But one of them is thinking outside the box. If it doesn't fit, I'm going to say, OK, they, she, does, she, she knew that. No, there are times in which you have information that you need to ignore. And this is one of them. In fact, we did a, um, a chest x-ray, a lateral, which showed calcification in the pericardial sac. And also an MRI demonstrated that this was a tick in the pericardium. And of course, the treatment is to actually remove this surgically, a process called stripping. Okay, so Dr. Barbara is here. She's uh, at home. Uh, this is part of her 50th uh, wedding anniversary, so she's on this tour for the, for the, for the next year. <laughs> So I'd go home sometimes and say, you know, well, I have this case here. What, what do you think? And then she'll tell me the answer in about 10 seconds. Right? So here, here's a picture you look at very carefully. You say, ah, oh. if, if you go through your, in your minds, uh, you could say, here again, I'm talking about looking at something and not just seeing it. The expert will take one look and say, I see it. I have the answer. You might want to ask yourself the question, is this a man or a woman? So most likely it's, uh, it's a man, the hair distribution, muscularity. It's covering, I don't expect you to notice because you've got a very warm climate here. Some people call this a shawl sign. So this patient actually came to me and uh, he had the muscle pains and I didn't quite get the answer yet. So I had my dermatologist colleague down the road and said, ah, you have this gentleman here, you want to come and take it? She took one look with Dr. Rose and said, oh, don't you know what a shawl sign is? This is about 30 years ago. I know what a shawl sign is now. So this is, a, and this is dermatomyositis, right? So here's a, another case for you. I'm watching the, ta the, the time here and make sure that I don't go over too much here. So he's 70 years old an executive, and he had a multiple colonic polypectomy. This, is, this was not congenital polyposis coli, which you guys all read about. Anyway, it was taken care of. He developed a small CVA. I saw him in my corridor, and I said, where are you going, Jim? And Jim said, ah, uh, my leg's a little weak today. But I'm, anyway, I said, no, you don't go anywhere. Come to my office. Yes, I brought him to my office, and I said, uh, you know something? You had a little stroke. And we confirmed that on the MRI. He did okay for a year, and then he's in his office. He had a cardiac arrest. 
most comfortable. Just look at that person passing his office was schooled in doing ex cardiac massage. Really, cardiac massage and, and admitted to one of my sister hospitals, St. Michael's Hospital. So they called me and said, look, uh, Jim wants you to take him back to your own hospital. I said, oh, no, I like St. Michael's. I'll come and visit you tomorrow. So the next day I go to St. Michael's and I'm walking up to the, his bed and he's 20 feet away and he's shouting out to me, Dr. Open Kong, I hear you coming. That's your steps. It's 20 feet away. So, so you know that this gentleman had a great outcome. He had ventricular tachycardia, resuscitated. So we expect a good outcome. Did a cardiac catheterization. No major coronary artery disease. Discharged in hospital in good, good health, meaning that only one broke a rib because of the, the pumping. Right? And this is the art of looking. A year later, he had abdominal pain, seen in Hamilton Hospital, said, no, go back to Toronto. Dr. Hoping Kong will see you. So I saw him the next day. And I said, uh, Jimbo, what's happening to you? He said, I've got these purpuric spots, he called them purple spots all over. And his eyelids looks like that. I said, oh, this is strange, he had a stroke. Got better noise, got abdominal pain. So I went home, said to Barbara, this gentleman had some purpuric thing on his eyelid. And she said, oh, that's eyelid purple. Don't you know he has amyloid disease? So this is a case of amyloidosis, diagnosed by someone who never even seen the patient. So, it's a great story here because amyloidosis is usually a condition that you die from. It's, it's, it's almost like a cancer, the abnormal proteins, etc. This gentleman, because of his age, was treated with a, a low intensity chemotherapy at Princess Margaret Hospital, one of my um, four hospitals. He was one of those cases that became an internationally recognized. His doctor, Tiedemann, goes and presents his case all over the world. So here's a case of amyloidosis that survived even with a small dose of uh, chemotherapy. So I'm going to listen now. Listen to your patient. He's telling you the diagnosis. I'm saying, listen to the dermatologist. She's telling you the diagnosis, right? So this 56 year old man had a six month history of increasing low back pain. One of the most difficult things to, to look at from a clinician's point, okay, so non-specific. In fact, we waste so much money and time x-raying backs. There's a rule in Ontario that said, people with back for the first time, none of them should actually be x-rayed. Can you imagine that? And a patient is saying, what if there's a fracture? What if I have cancer? They said, sorry, no x-rays. Anyway, he, he went to the workman compensation board and was told that uh, you have a mechanical backache. That's uh, a way of saying, we don't know what's wrong with you. Anyway, he developed hematuria. Big sign of hematuria. There are urologists here, so they'll, they'll, they'll like this, of course. Uh, before you went there, you went to nephrology, they say, hey, you might have this IgA nephropathy, another condition that you can't prove and I can't disprove. There's no test for IgA nephropathy. Or you have this immature, we find no cause, so we call it IgA nephropathy. So he goes to urology and, of course, they cystoscope him. Normal. Lost 30 pounds. This man was desperate. Came to my office, crawling. Doctor, you need to do something. I'm going to die. When a patient tells you that, sometimes patients tell you that because they want to be seen or there's a neurotic and so on, but this guy really was serious. A key here, one of his fingers went black temporarily. So those of you who are thinking, What's going on? He's got backache. Maybe he has some kind of cancer. Why is his finger black? Took my telescope, 
Now listen to his heart. Those of you who know it, that's Pansy sort of murmur. This is mitral regurgitation. The diagnosis is endocarditis. And endocarditis nowadays is a masquerader. It could happen here too. If you've got rheumatic heart disease, known valve problem, it's easy. We can just take a listen, look for Osler's nodes, Janeway lesions, rod spots, splenomegaly, arthritis. Do the cultures, not a big problem. Or if you have congenital heart disease, it's, it's a risk. Places where you don't have a lot of valvular heart disease or a patient who has no known mechanical valve, it's not so easy. So it's been through so many places. Neurology, we can forgive them for not listening to the heart. It's okay. And nephrologist, probably not. Oh, it's above the diaphragm. Kidneys are below the diaphragm. <laughs> so we need to listen, right? Okay, let's get back to um, these uh, basic sort of fundamental physical diagnostic uh, approaches. There I was, just two years ago, you guys, a casualty officer, just finished internship. This guy was sent to me because uh, they said, please drain this abscess. Oh, abscess, does he have fever? We don't know. Is it painful? Yes, it's painful. And then, what's the history? Don't forget that guy who had Ebola, went to a big hospital in Texas. Remember? Just a couple of years ago. What did we do? We as doctors. We did a CT scan on him, gave him antibiotics and sent him home. Nobody asked him, where are you from? What's going on in West Africa? Good to have you in, 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 you know, in, in the United States. Have a good time here. Hey, but what? You from West Africa? Where's that? Anyway, he was shot by the policeman in the back of the right knee while fleeing a robbery scene. So I examined him and his knee was doing this. And of course, the scalpel was right over there. The nurse, Dr. Opekang, you ready? We've got 60 patients in the emergency room. <laughs> And uh, so he really had what is called a popliteal aneurysm, which is really a false aneurysm. The bullet made a contact between artery and vein, and you develop an artificial fistula. So I think if I had done that, I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> <laughs> so he who studies medicine without books sails on uncharted sea, but he who studies medicine without patient does not go to sea at all. Very appropriate for the Bahamas. Uh, let's see the surround. Even the rain last night, I said it rained in the Bahamas. I thought it was a dry climate, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm moving on now. I left Jamaica in about 1973. Went to McGill Royal Victoria Hospital. And of course, I was warned by Vivian Brooks, surgeon who taught me, taught some of us here, I think. At the back there, Viv Brooks, yep. He said, when you go to Montreal now, remember, you need to be a very specialized person. They are super specialists. So don't worry about the simple things, big things. Uh, make sure that you remind that you're a sickle cell anemia specialist. I did my PhD in sickle cell anemia. Anyway, so I arrived there and I went to speak to my chief of medicine. He said, uh, Sir, Dr. Beck, sorry, sir, I came to ask what my job description is. So he looked at me. And he said, Dr. Hoping Kong, we have no job description for you. And I, I was really was shocked at that. Anyway, he said, let's go do whatever you want to do. Of course, <laughs> I came from being a, a, a West Indian doctor. Dr. Chia there, she's uh, causing the ward, and she sees what they, they presented to her. So I actually said, oh, let me just go do my, um, my ward rounds, as I usually do. So I started my day. First, uh, second week of my tenure, I went to the wards and met a senior resident, and I work on 30 resident from the United States, two interns and four clinical clerks, and they're in the corridor chattering away. And I said, oh, doc, good to have you, sir. I said, yep. Well, what have you got to show me today? You know, what are the patients that we got to take? 
Dr. Hu Ping Kang, we have this gentleman and we are going to do a biopsy on this afternoon. This is a third year resident now. I'm, going, I'm asking the chief resident to give me a hand with this. I said, yes. I said, what's wrong with him? He's got a liver mass, sir. We think he's got cancer. We didn't tell him that, but we said that we need to find out what it is. And I've, I've read about how to do a liver biopsy. I've arranged for somebody to watch me. And uh, we've done the protrum in time. And, uh, and the, the student said, yes, and we examined this morning with a very big liver, sir. The best liver I ever felt. And this guy had only been in medical school for two years. And the best liver still. So I said, okay, let me, please give me a chance. Let me go exhibit. In my, where am I from? We examine patients, you know. No, you don't have to. It's all set, you know. And he's moving on to the next guy. I said, no, I'll take 15 seconds. I go examine this guy. By manual palpation. Know about that? Yeah. <laughs> so I turned to him and I said, I said, Tom, you know, you're going to biopsy a kidney. And he said, everybody stopped. Four students, two interns. What are you saying? A kidney? Biopsy a kidney? I said, yeah. The mass is a kidney. So my next question is, you can always say, where's the ultrasound, right? I said, where is the intravenous pylogram? In those days, the intravenous pylogram was the, the imaging sort of uh, uh, thing that you had to do. We didn't do it because we were sure it was the liver, sir. So the guy said to me, in his American accent, OK, rounds are finished today. He runs off, gets the IVP, and then two hours later says, it's a kidney. That really changed the way medicine is practiced at, uh, at McGill and the rest of Canada. We used to do ward rounds in the corridor. How do I know? The videotaping of ward rounds. It's all 99% in the corridor. And they go to the patient, and the patient is sort of reluctant, and off they go. So I think that's important to go back to the bedside and shows you how important pal palpation can be. Even today, we got such great, great imaging. We need to feel for the sister Marie Josie node of ovarian cancer or gastric carcinoma. We need to feel to make sure that what we feel is not feces, but lymph nodes. We don't have to do a CAT scan on every single person. We need to palpate the testes to make sure that this is not a varicocele, that is not a testicular carcinoma. These are words I'm using because this is what I've done in the past, and I can tell you, to feel a testicular lymphoma by hand and saying, don't go to Los Angeles today. You need to go see the urologist to have this biopsy. Okay. So medicine is learned by the bedside, not in the classroom. Let not your conception of disease come from words heard in the lecture room. Except for February the 16th, 2017. <laughs> but then, of course, I'm showing, you, I'm showing you cases. And even though this is vicarious, there is good evidence that you can learn something from doing it this way. Right. OK, now listening. Let's do a different type of listening. And this has a lot of uh, Canadian and also Bahaman content as we go through this. This man is 15 year, 50 years old. He's a detective. I'm unwell for six months. Ah, minor abdominal pain. So I talked to him about what it meant to be a policeman. I um, almost know what it is. I heard a lot of sirens last night. So I don't have to say anything. I said, where are they going? Is that the ambulance or is it something else? It sounded more like a police than an ambulance. Is that correct? You can distinguish the two? Yeah, they go faster, one of them. The police, that is, not the ambulance. This guy was teaching rookie cops how to shoot. So my question to him, where are you practicing? Of course, to me, you're shooting when I, I'm Jamaica, you're shooting in the range outside. South Camp Road or something, really, right? <laughs> Camp Road, right. <laughs> So the next question was uh, one of these things that I, I don't know where it came from. I said, where do you eat your lunch? 
And the guy said, why are you asking me this question? You know, I'm sick. Can't even work now. I'm tired. You know, I'm going to lose my, my job. My wife's complaining, you know. I said, where did you eat your lunch? I eat it right there, sir. Me and my partner. So he and his partner was on your lunch. I was just saying, do you have breakfast too there? But I didn't have to do that. This guy had lead poisoning. And you might say, how, how did he make that diagnosis? How did he jump from a guy without feeling? So many people feel unwell, little fatigue. Chronic fatigue syndrome. You can't prove it, and I can't disprove it. Anyway, he had lead poisoning. And I think this story is also a modern story, one with the last the history of medicine. If you go to Kushadasi in Turkey, you go to those great Roman sort of buildings, they were actually running water along the canal lined with lead sometimes. Professor Bach, professor of pediatrics, 1960s University College of West Indies, you said, we don't want these cribs to be here. We want you to scrape the paint off and repaint it because these cribs have lead paint on them. So I was aware that there was something called lead poisoning. If you look in Toronto, you go to something called the Junction Triangle. There's a battery factory there, and the, the battery leads were made of lead. So there was lead poisoning in that era 30, 40 years ago. So we did know something about lead. And this is a strange image, but this is in the Great North, the Arctic. This is the Franklin exhibition. It's a couple of years ago. Franklin went to find the Northwest Patches 200 years ago. Got stuck on the ice. Spent two years, his men wandering in circles. And we always wondered, why was that so? Why did Franklin men, the most brilliant navigator, maritime expert of his era, how come he got lost? How did he allow, why did he allow his men to die? It so happened that uh, about 15 years ago, permission was given for University of Alberta, in Edmonton, Canada, to exhume some of those bodies. And they found that there was high lead content among the soldiers. And what happened is that the year before Franklin left on this great big expedition, there was a new method of soldering bully beef, which I think is a staple of the Bahama diet. No. It's called corned beef, right? Anyway, corned beef. So the, this beautiful lead soldering produced lead poisoning, and these people became encephalopathic with lead poisoning and died walking in a circle. And the Canadian expedition was able to dis discover it's one of the boats that was found. And of course, the lead poisoning story doesn't end there. Because if we go back just a couple of years to Flint, Michigan, you guys read the news? Here's this township near Detroit, Ross Belt is called. Things aren't going well, we are trying to save money, so we switch our water pipe system from the one we have is too expensive to one that's older. And they did it for two years without checking the water system and produced hundreds of cases of lead poisoning in 2014, 15 in North America, in the richest country in the world. So lead is important. And you can understand why I have an interest in this. So let's go down then towards the last third of my list as I get to within 15 minutes of trying to finish here. So here is a, a completely new problem. She's 28 years old, and she's got neurofibromatosis. It's one of these things you read about, you might see a few cases, but we tend to ignore it. These people might get a scalloping of their uh, x-rays as, as it affects the spinal column. But she had something special, something called plexiform neurofibromatosis. It meant that she's got this great big tangled mass of blood vessels covering her in almost her entire trunk. You have to see it to believe it. This is hanging down 
you know. Of course, she was very active. So she went and had a skiing uh, trip, fell, and started to bleed. She required 25 points of blood, 25 units of blood before they could control the bleeding. This is seven times her body uh, fluid, her uh, blood volume replacement. So she was sent to me by the dean. He said she had a massive plexiform neurofibromatosis. At the time, I couldn't even pronounce it. Never seen it before. So I said. So I told her, look, we have a solution for you. And the solution was actually to embolize these, um, uh, these vessels. And how did I come to the conclusion? I had a partner who was a neuroradiologist. Neuro so radiologist who specialized in the brain. And he had developed techniques for embolizing AV malformations in the brain. It's a big problem in neurology and neurosurgery. So I went to him and said, look, I have this massive plexiform neurofibromatosis. And he said to me, what's that? I said, you leave it in small, this is very large. He was so excited, he said, look, we, it's perfect for us. I said, she was bleeding. Even better when she's bleeding, he said, right? So he took her and he, he actually embolized these things over several trips to his office. And she had them resected. That's how I came, because I had a friend, a partner. So one of the, the things about modern medicine, besides the thing I'm talking about, is to be able to relate to your classmates here, to your partners, relate to your specialists, self-specialists. Because the one-man show no longer feasible. We need to work as teams. But at the same time, you need to be thinking about what medicine really is, what you can contribute. So here we got into the gray zone now. So in this era when we talk about being precise, having genetic disease, you've got cystic fibrosis with genes so and so. You've got familial endurance fever, and your gene is XY89. You know, you've got the breast cancer gene. The list goes on and on. The era of personalized medicine is here. It's good for us, good for patients. But what about those patients we don't have that information? How, how are we going to make the diagnosis much less treat? So here's one. A little complicated now because we're coming towards the end. A six and nine year old man from Cambodia. He's got a cranial pharyngioma. One of my favorites, you know why? When I was a neurosurgical resident or intern, I spent three months with Dr. Andrew Massa at Mona. And we saw a few cases of cranial pharyngeal. It was, it was interesting, so I wasn't afraid of it. So when you do it, though, this is a tumor of Radke's pouch. It sits just above the pituitary gland. You can see why then it will affect the pituitary and end up having effect on the hormonal system. But being from, from Cambodia, though, he also had hepatitis B and C and developed hepatocellular carcinoma, which is one of the complications of hepatitis C and hepatitis B. So you had a liver transplant. So first of all, a person has brain, benign disease, liver cancer, it's a liver transplant. We felt so happy, but then a year later he had a, a lung metastasis. Technology now, video assisted thoracic surgery. Went in there, took it out, doing well. This man then has a neurosurgical resection, liver transplant, and a vast resection of his lung. But the symptoms were non-specific. Muscle pain, stiffness, weight loss. He couldn't walk. And then he's got signs that he's got organic disease now. This is not chronic fatigue syndrome, not anxiety neurosis. He's anemic. His ESR is 150. C-reactive protein 150. So what's wrong? Is liver cancer return? Lung metastasis? Is craniopharyngeal causing adrenal insufficiency? So his doctor called me. Here's his communication now. And I got called by a thoracic surgeon. 
this is Tom Waddell calling. I said, oh, why are you calling me? I'm only an internal medicine person. You know? He said, look, this is not my problem. I think you're going to help us here. So I spoke to a deliver physician when well. He said, oh, I, I don't think so. The nurse practitioner tells me that it's something else. We proved that he was hypothyroid and hypoadrenal from his craniopharyngioma. That was easy, just do measurement of his cortisol and his thyroid. But his ESR is 150. So what's that? So what, does, what gives you fatigue and tiredness, unable to move? You're so stiff, it takes him two hours to get out of bed. There's something called polymyalgia rheumatica. What is this? My favorite disease. You can't prove it, and I can't disprove it. <laughs> but this, this is where we use a therapeutic trial. So at the time, I had a, a Mandarin-speaking student with me, and, and she actually was able to see what happened. So we gave him low-dose prednisone, which is 20 milligrams only. This is not temporal arthritis. They are related. In temporal arthritis, you have to use 60 milligrams. In, in polymagic rheumatica, it's only 20 milligrams. Within 24 hours, he was feeling better, up doing an exam, exercise, Tai Chi, etc. In his own words, in Mandarin, it was a miracle. So that's a therapeutic trial. And you finish it off by doing his, his general well being, his ESR, C reactive protein, they all return to normal. So this man had polymyalgia rheumatica. Disease in that gray zone for which we have no specific diagnostic test for. Yet, we need to take care of the patient. For him, we were fortunate. Yeah. So, as we reach the end of our hour, the art of medicine really encompassing a number of conditions. I've dealt with uh, seeing or looking, hearing or listening, feeling or palpating. So I've made that differentiation. The fact that you do it's an active process. We touched on the art of communication, empathy, advocacy. To me, that's the meat of the art of medicine. It's the foundation in which everything else is built. It's the reason why medicine will always be needed, not to shore up, but to complement technology and science. We did a little thinking outside the box. We dealt with uncertainty. Can deal with, we can deal with rare diseases. And of course, I hinted a little bit about dealing with epidemics. So the last message I have for you, this is not my slide, it's made by Paul Dorian. Not to let even insurmountable difficulties stand in the way of good and heroic deeds. There's no greater joy than being your brothers and sisters keepers. And that's the motor that has driven me for 50 years. It's a great pleasure being here. And I look forward to seeing you at 12.30. Thank you. At this time, we will entertain questions. If anyone has any questions for Professor Dr. Barrett. Yes, sir. Uh, Professor, um, thank you so much for your inspiration and your encouragement. Um, the, I appreciated the, the plug for psychiatry. <laughs> um, because this is what I've been insisting on quite some time, this art of medicine, why do we human beings? Um, how do we incorporate that now, that approach into our general education, so that we help the, the institution understand where the focus needs to be uh, in relation to dealing with the need to understand technology and to maneuver with technology, but not to neglect these other most important uh, knowledge bases and skills 
attributes that you uh, so that it would be a plan? I think there's a quiet revolution going on, and the people have always supported the humane approach to medicine, holistic approach. The voice isn't as strong as those who push personalized medicine, genetics, science, and technology. But it's there. Just a, a few weeks ago, I was uh, in London, Ontario, speaking to first year medical students in Ontario. There are 600 of them. And in fact, I, when I went, um, I wondered, how can you be a, a first year student for two weeks and then set up a, a talk where you can invite a, a speaker who is not known in Canada or anywhere else because he's not a teacher? Who do you know to go call him to come and give you the keynote address? So I went out to London saying, ah, oh, you know, they're probably having a big party. London is where Labatt's makes beers and so on. And, and it's very famous for a party town. Is that right, Christine? Yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I hope one of your children are not going to London, Ontario. <laughs> so they wanted me to talk about the future of medicine. And then so for, for a first year student talk about the future of medicine, you know. So I went, and in fact, uh, they were dead serious. They want to know what it is to be a doctor. And if you look at what my dean presently is saying, uh, Trevor Young, he's a, he's a psychiatrist. He's writing now about the, the need to, to make sure that we maintain the human part of medicine. That we make sure that uh, our relationship to patients. And uh, believe it or not, uh, a book that I wrote actually is being translated in Taiwan at the moment for distribution to 12,000 medical students at 12 medical students in a, and residents in Taiwan. And the words they're using is that we do not want our students and doctors to be robots. It's like a blog I'm making, right? But in fact, the answer to your question is that uh, we need to think about it. We are pressed so much for time that we end up with our little computer in our hand and the patient is sitting there saying, what the hell is he doing? And then you're plugging away. And if it doesn't work, then you're going to curse it and, and then the patient leaves and there's no interaction. I think we need to deal with that. There's a way of dealing with it. But uh, I tell you, when the technology appeared first in my hospital, having a computer do all your blood work, etc., put in there, residents in surgery was getting to work at 4.30 in the morning to put their CBC in before the rounds of the surgeon at 7 o'clock. There's a computer at every single bed in the hospital, at great cost, of course, $75 million, all down the drain because it just couldn't work. So I think we need to think seriously about we use technology wisely. And of course, patients can now email stuff back and forth, even though I'm not in that, that age group for that. So there are ways of dealing with the communication issue. But I think that uh, senior medical students, residents, staff people need to be role models for this kind of care. We're doctors first and technicians afterwards. Not every single doctor need to have all of what I've said. Because if you're a surgeon and you do brain surgery, for example, you need to be able to take the brain that's diseased out, not the good part. But of course, you still need to talk to the patient. For example, I have a patient now who's been sick for 30 years. Why? She's got anxiety, pain, cancer, etc. Because when she sat with a surgeon 30 years before, he said, Lady, you have a breast lump. It's probably a cancer. And how do you even deal with breast cancer? He did this. He lunged at her. We cut it out. She never forgot that. But I think there is, that's of course at the far end of the spectrum. But I think that we need to be mentors. We need to uh, let people uh, be, not be afraid of demonstrating that you're empathetic towards your patient. Of course, you don't want to go through the way where you were so empathetic you start crying at the bedside at every single day. <laughs> or spend time doing your social history and not worrying about the fact the patient has hemoptysis. There's a balance there. But thank you very much for your question, sir. Are there any other questions or comments? 
Okay. Well, Professor Ho Bing Kong, thank you very much for your inspirational and insightful talk, and we look forward to hearing from you again at 12.30 this afternoon. Yes, and it... Uh, I know you like repetition, but it won't be the same talk. Okay, folks, I'm going to get along with the afternoon lecture by our distinguished visiting professor, uh, Professor Herbert Ho Ping Kong, who, just to remind those of you who were not here this morning, Professor Ho Ping Kong is a distinguished graduate of UWI. What year was that, sir? Or you don't want to tell? 1965. 1965. Most of you weren't even a thought. Um, all of you weren't a thought. Uh, Professor Ho Ping Kong has a distinguished and illustrious career uh, in Canada, beginning in, in Montreal at McGill and now at the University of Toronto. He's a world-renowned educator, medical educator, and internal medicine specialist. And uh, this morning he spoke to us about the art of medicine. And this afternoon he's going to speak to us about education, practice, and philanthropy in medicine. Professor Ho Ping Kong. Okay, I'm going to try and speak a little louder to make sure that you can all hear me. Am I doing okay so far? Yes. Great. Uh, I think it's because of my height. <laughs> you guys might not reala realize that, but you've had, long, you've had lunch already. Yeah? So when I was at St. George's College, uh, I used to like sports. It wasn't any good. Because can you believe that I was a high jumper? I'm giving an example or an excuse of why I have trouble with this mic not being as tall as I should be. But I was also a sprinter. And those of you who know Jamaica sports know that Usain Bolt and all those great uh, uh, runners. But I was the slowest sprinter in the history of the school. But maybe I was a cricketer. And I was a cricketer. And believe it or not, I was a pace bowler. A fast bowler, in other words. The slowest fast bowler in the history of the school. So you can see that I came from a very sort of a background which had overcome a lot of difficulties. I think I start uh, today, especially with what's happening in your environment, the newspapers, headline news. I have this 29 year old uh, engineering uh, graduate. We used to run a computer store. So in his store in Toronto, near Jane and Finch, he was robbed. He was shot four or five times. Went to Sunnybrook Hospital, had his uh, bowel resected, his kidney resected on one side, out of his liver and his spleen. It was, a, what, it was six, six years before I saw him. So he comes to me now and he, he said, Oh, I've been having this severe backache which has completely devastated my life and no answer. Many trips to the emergency room, trips to the orthopedic surgery. He had x-rays, they were normal. So I saw this young man, what, what struck me is that here's somebody who had a surgical problem. And he had all those organs removed. And I, and I said to myself, well, why is this man having such severe backache? And then it struck me, he had his spleen removed. Because if you look at me, you say, what are you talking about, spleen? That organ is of no use to us. What does it do? It only creates problems, they say. If you injure yourself in a motor vehicle accident, you're going to have a splenectomy. Anyway, I repeated a CT scan, and this man had osteomyelitis of his spine. 
And the key to this diagnosis was a history of the splenectomy. Because as most of you know who are doing the reading, when you have a splenectomy, Dr. Ramphal knows about this, you are prone to encapsulated organism invasion. And of course, other organisms too. So that was the diagnosis. Osteomyelitis of the spine, of, of the spine following splenectomy some six years previously. So what was missing here? So following a splenectomy, you need to have immunization against pneumococcal vaccine and some of those organisms that we know can attack the body when your spine is removed. So it's a lesson for you in terms of thinking about things, even though they might seem unrelated, sometimes they may be. And then today's talk is going to be about education, practice, and philanthropy. So I'm taking you now towards the twilight of my career, some 12 years before. I'm sitting in my office said, well, you know, my age, retirement age at the University of Toronto, probably time to sit back and give advice. Some people say be mentoring to students. It was a good, a good choice. But along came um, Ray Chan, who's a philanthropist, and said, you know, we don't think you should retire yet. I said, but I'm 65. He said, oh, I'll make it easier for you. So he actually created a, a professorship in, a, in internal medicine called, in the name of his parents, Maisie and Gladson Chan. Uh, chair in the teaching of general internal medicine. So I said, OK, but I, I'll teach. Yeah, I've always taught. I never lectured, as I told you this morning. Then. So maybe I'll find a different way of teaching. This is not Bahamas, by the way. This happens to be where? Jamaica. Jamaica, yeah, this is Jamaica. It's better in the Bahamas. <laughs> I told you. So, I want to talk about uh, five things in the next half an hour or so about practice and teaching, about the subject of the fellowship, about a center which bears my name now, uh, a little bit more about uh, art of medicine from a practical point of view. And then if we have time, I'll talk about my support to other medication, education programs. So, beginning about, uh, I would say, almost 20 years ago, when I was a full-time uh, professor, full-time consulting physician, got a call from Owen Morgan. He's a, he was the Dean of Medicine in Jamaica. And he said that, you know, we wanted to improve our capabilities in intensive care medicine and respiratory medicine. And if there was any way we could help in the training of a couple of these uh, new physicians. And at the time, we had Dr. Paul Scott with him as a attending physician. And I agreed that we would try and do this. So we were able to gather enough funds to bring Dr. Scott to Toronto for two years to do intensive care medicine and also respiratory medicine. I'm pleased to say to this point, I think he's now senior lecturer in medicine at Mona. And he was followed quickly by Dr. Altia Quart, who did a similar program. Uh, the next thing to happen was that uh, Charlie Denbo, not a famous uh, uh, physician and chairman in our know, department at Mona, started to discuss training of cardiovascular uh, physicians. And so we started uh, with uh, Victor Elliott, followed by Lisa Horlick, Marco Sam, Claudia Lewis, etc. We noticed that we're talking about two programs. We're talking about ICU respiratory medicine, we're talking about cardiology. What's happening elsewhere? We could do this because there was funding in Toronto 
for those programs. So, beginning in about 2006, 2007, Rachel came back from Jamaica and said, I heard that you are training physicians to go back to Jamaica to teach and practice. I said, yeah. He said, uh, how is it going? I said, it's going, going real well, but we cannot cover all the self-specialties in internal medicine. And those of you who know that we have something like 15 or 16 different self-specialties. So Chan, through this form, said, don't worry, how much does it cost to do one of these? And I said, $50,000 Canadian per year. So Ray turned and I said, I'll give you a million dollars, one million dollars. So he set up this uh, Chan Fellowship called the uh, Raymond Chan Subspecialty Fellowship in, uh, for, the, for Caribbean trains. And the reason why we needed, we need to cover neurology, rheumatology, infectious diseases, endocrinology, uh, and so on. So to this day, we have had something like 35 trains come from the Caribbean to University of Toronto, University Health Network, to do two years of so special training. So there have been 35 people so far, and, and you know we have 26 of them already been back to the Caribbean. So where are they? They are in Jamaica, at Mona, Kingston Public Hospital. They are in Montego Bay, Cornwall Regional Hospital. They are in Antigua, Trinidad, Guyana, St. Kitts. So most of the subjects have been covered, a combination of the Chan Fellowship and the UHN program itself. Again, this is not uh, Bahama. This is actually a round hill in Jamaica, one of my favorite places. So Hilary Beckles, who now the vice chancellor uh, at one of the award ceremonies for me recently, uh, paid tribute to Ray Chan uh, for setting up these fellowships. And he said, this will redound to the benefit of Caribbean societies at home and abroad well into the future. And I actually got this order of distinction, uh, order of Jamaica, um, for this uh, project. But I must say that this is not about me alone. It was nice to be honored. It's about all those people at my hospital back home who said they have a training from Jamaica, different culture, different standard of care, etc. Maybe not as scientific or sophisticated, but we'll take them. It's credit to them, my partners in respirology, endocrinology, cardiology, who had the courage to go, and also the resources to do this. And of course, to Raymond Chan, uh, former chancellor of Rising, a fellow Jamaican, fellow Caribbean person, who was wise enough and had resources to do this. So we're grateful to him. He has since passed away, and I've given this talk in part for his memory. So let me bring you forward into 2008, that's just about eight years ago. So one of my chief residents went to the Royal College exams. You all know OSCE exams, etc. so I don't explain to you what it is. So he was given this mannequin that was able to duplicate or reproduce heart sounds. Being a really good resident, he had no trouble. He passed the exam easily. So he came back and said, oh, I did the exam, I'm okay. But they gave me this, this mannequin and I couldn't tell what it was. So I said to him, well, why didn't you practice? Well, you all guys practice for exams. He said, no, we don't have any machine. So I said, okay, no worry. I'll buy you one. Imagine me, a poor little telling physician. No private practice, by the way. Uh, we could so happen that my, some of my partners, my colleagues, were saying, you're getting gray here, it's time for you to go. They started giving me a few thousand dollars here and there. So I had about $20,000. So I said, okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll use the $20,000 to buy this machine. The very next day, Dr. Sybil, who was a doctor, came back and said, 
Here is a brochure. It was $100,000 US. Of course, my wife is here. I said, well, maybe I will tell her that we go to the bank and borrow the money or something. Anyway, I didn't have the heart to tell her no. I said, well, okay, we're going to go ahead. The very next day, one of my patients, uh, who was a board chairman, came up and said, uh, anything new in your hospital? I said, yeah. I promised to buy the residence a machine, and I don't have enough money. He said, don't worry. Here is $50,000. That's my philanthropy part of it again. Right. So because of this, we were able to say, look, if, if we can do this, what will we use this machine for? It could be as simple as allowing you to listen to mitral stenosis or make sure you know what uh, Austin Flint murmur was or say what's a patent doctor's arteriosis or even this may be pericarditis and we never really heard what this was from the students so maybe it would be better if you can practice on, on a machine as such. So this not only brought Harvey to us but it also convinced Rodrigo Cavalcante, my partner, to say, let's find, let, let's, let's create a center, a, a center that will study medical education, that will be, we'll have practice at a very high level, and then we will introduce innovations and scholarship in practice-based medical education. So here is the, we started out naming the center SEEP, Center for of Excellence in Education and Practice. And then Rachel came along, <coughs> Chancellor Bryson, and he renamed this uh, Herbert Hoping Kong Center of Excellence by donating $2.5 million uh, to do this. It's very interesting because in 2009, I was sort of semi-retired, and my hospital decided to pay tribute they said he was a legend, even he was alive. So I, th I thought about Bob Marley then. I'm not a legend like him. Anyway, at this function, uh, I was honored. Everybody said, he did a good job, etc. And uh, Ray Chan got up and made a donation of $2.5 million to rename uh, the center. So I got up, like I'm doing today, and said, thank you to Ray for the $2,500. <laughs> and you know, the recording, the video of that exists, and I was like, gosh, how could I make a mistake like that? And I mean, that was embarrassing. So what do we do there? Uh, there are novel education programs for improving teaching. We do diagnostic reasoning. We do procedural skills. And uh, as, you can, as you see, we are actually of a program to help residents and to develop empathy and communication skills. So here is Harvey. That, that, that's him there. So very interesting tale. When Harvey arrived, we had him in a room hidden from everybody because we don't want him to be stolen. So. My, um, my housekeeper was from St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica. Went in the room and saw this guy on the floor, yeah. naked. Uh, and she ran out and started screaming out to all the residents and doctors, hey, guess what? He's naked and he has no legs. <laughs> so that's our introduction to have for, for the, uh, the housekeeping staff. Uh, this is actually a program I run, I run also uh, once uh, a year in the summer for um, Caribbean uh, students, high school students, who are taking up in medicine or, um, or, or nursing. And they come and we spend a half a day doing um, deep medical things for them. And, and this is my partner, Dr. Danny Panisco, teaching uh, students uh, about Harvey. Some are palpating, but they all have a chance to listen. We also have, uh, in simulation, uh, an echo simulator, which 
uh, senior residents can learn how to use to detect valvular heart disease or pericardial effusions. And down below, we are, have a bedside ultrasound machine, which can tell us where to put the needle for a patient for the cites or for the chest for a pleural effusion. Dr. Richardson, who was one of my uh, colleagues, also developed a program uh, called The Art of Medicine, a lecture series. Exploring those parts of medicine which are not technical or scientific, about empathy, communication skills. For example, even further, what role should we be playing as physicians in the assisted suicide or the, assisted, or the euthanasia project that's going on? So it's been a very successful program which runs uh, for about six months of the year, and it's in its fourth year, uh, and it's been really a very um, well-received program. We have been scholarly, and by using Harvey not only to teach physical diagnostic skills, but also as, a, as an examination tool, we can design programs to test the usefulness of this approach for clinical reasoning. And here's one paper from Academic Medicine. So our center also supported eight fellows in a six-year period. And these people usually go to Miami, where Harvey was actually born, developed by uh, one of the staff physicians there. I go to Holland and Maastricht to do a master's degree in medical education. So we, so we currently have three fellowship positions, and this group, uh, under my leadership, achieved national and international impact in research and innovation. This happens to be a a fierce looking animal. He's very gentle, actually. This is Charlie, who happens to be a, a St. Bernard. And he sort of keeps me on even keel, along with my, my wife. Don't get too, too, uh, too high, and don't go too low. Either. So Charlie, wherever you are, you're back home in a few days. OK, so what's this art of medicine I've been talking about? I have lots of advice from my bosses, president, etc., saying, you know, you've done a lot of good work in your clinics and on awards, but you don't publish a lot. Don't you think that you should be doing more? It was all in, in, a, in a good spirit. And I, I thought about this, and I said, you know, I published one uh, case history, and they are telling me that the case history, is in terms of academic value, didn't have a very high level of, um, of, uh, of a remuneration. So I said, well, why should I waste my time doing that then? So I kept the cases, not only for myself, but for the residents who came to visit and the clinical clerks for electives. And I've been doing that for about 30 years now. Finally, about three years ago, I said, probably my time to put in writing some of those cases that I have recorded. Them. Usually just one line, the name and the diagnosis. I did this because 20 years ago, two of my elective students came and said, we want to know what's a great case in internal medicine. I, I never was asked a question before, and I said, well, why don't you find out? You go through these 2,000 cases and pick the best ones you can. And they did, after six weeks, they picked out 200 cases. So I started there. And within about two or three years, I had 1,000 cases. So these are the uses cases I've done some today, and I just get on to it. So I started to uh, interview with uh, a great writer from the Global Mail newspaper in Toronto, named Michael Posner. So we'll, we'll sit and discuss uh, cases or whatever I wanted to talk about. And then, um, so one day he came in and said, uh, Dr. Oping, well, it's good to see you. You know, I had some chest pain here. Same story again, and I said, uh, well, what, what's, what's the problem? 
my doctor told me that I, I don't have uh, angina, that if it goes away to exercise, that's okay. I think we, we are taught that, but there are some patients who have this so-called walk-through angina. So I walked in the car, I said to my friend, Dr. John Janewski, I said, John, can you please see him? <coughs> John said, sure, next day. Next day he was seen, abnormal electrocardiogram, triple vessel, coronary artery disease. He was in surgery within two weeks. So that's how we started this book. <coughs> the other thing about this book is that uh, after a few weeks, I actually was able to, I'm all being rescued, Thank, thanks a lot. So I said, I'm gonna publish a book, it, it takes money to do this. We're paying this guy $100,000 just to write this stuff. So my um, first was speaking to one of my former students who was a neurosurgeon. I said, I'm writing this book, you know, and I think it's gonna be good. He said, what's the price gonna be for this book? I said, probably $25. He said, I'll buy 100 copies. Ah, I said, that's good. So I went to tour the people and they said the same, I'll buy 100 copies. So there's three people now, $3,500 each, that's $10,500. So I went to my friend, Ray Chang again, Chancellor of Rice University, said, look, I'm writing this book, I think it's going to be good, and guess what? I've raised $10,500. I thought, he said, oh, you did a great job, you know, it's good to be sort of, uh, you know, wise and make sure that you don't get a good financial deal, etc. He said, you're wasting your time. Of course, what? He said, you are responsible for doing the message. And how much is it going to cost? I said, $100,000 at least. He said, I'll set up a fund for you for $125,000. You've been writing and I'll raise the money. Of course, I celebrated and said, oh my goodness, this is a great story, you know. And being sort of uh, promoted or being helped with this great sum of money, it only lasted 24 hours. Because then I realized, there's this chancellor of the university saying, you better make sure this project is good. Otherwise, <laughs> anyway, we pressed on and uh, this thing was published in, uh, in 2014. The bestseller in Canada was gifted to all medical students across Canada, 3,000, and, and it, we continue to give this uh, to give this book to first-year medical students at the University of Toronto, all through the generosity of uh, of Mr. Chan. So why why is that important? It's important because. I think this is a time for us to think more deeply about what it means to be a physician. And as I said this morning, there are technical things, there are scientific things, there are skills we have to learn. But physicians need to be more than technicians. They need to have a more humane approach. We need to advocate for patients. We need to make sure that we communicate as best as we can. We need to use all those skills we have uh, to ensure that our patients get better care. If you can cure, it's important to, to care for them. So I come to this part of, somebody said uh, that Hose was a great uh, a physician on a television set. Uh, I never watched Hose. But I think this has given me a chance to, to think about what it means. And to me, as I said this morning, the meaning is that uh, we should be thinking about not only uh, ourselves, our patients, our community, because we indeed are all great, our brothers and sisters keepers. This book, though, has more, because when, when I did this initially, it wasn't my idea that 
that we're going to make a great success and become a bestseller. I did it because I felt an obligation to probably put in writing those patients that I had seen, all those great mentors that I had, Ronnie Irvin, Ben Cookshank, Andrew Massa, um, Viv Brooks, people who really led me along the right way. I, I needed to do something since I got a chance of doing this. And I thought the book was a way of doing it. So this book now has been put among my, uh, one of my cardiology colleagues, among the books that we think about in medicine. This one is a modern one. I think you had a chance to read it. Uh, with Osler, with Oliver Sacks, a neurologist who would written really well recently and is very popular, not among doctors, but also among uh, lay people. And then just recently, I, I was given an award in San Francisco where, for educational reasons, they want to create a new award. Uh, this organization was called the Federation of Chinese Medical Societies of Canada and the United States. There are 15 organizations. One was from Toronto, the rest from America. So when we were going to this, my um, colleagues said, look, we're going to propose you for this award. We want you to, to accept it if you can. It means going to San Francisco, but who would want to go to San Francisco? I said, yes, I'll go. Uh, so when I, I told him to take some books and take books and give to your friends in America. So when I reached there, uh, I said, we didn't get any books. I said, I sent 20 books. They were sort of half token. But I had one book left in my, um, in my hotel room, so I took this book and I I was going to give it to them. I said, oh, you can put straws for this. I know what happened. The chairman said, no, we need to um, auction this book. So he did it. He got out the dinner. Someone paid $500 for this book. So I knew that something was happening. But even more important, a senior neurologist from New York, and he was a uh, consultant neurologist at New York City Hospital, came that same night and said to me, you know, we are looking for this book for a long time. We want to translate this into Chinese in Taiwan. And we just finished signing a contract to do this. And the words to me were, what I use this morning again, is that we're doing this because we do not want our doctors to be robots. So this book has also had some uh, reviews, which I will read one for you from a Professor Madison at U of T. I had to go back to my office tonight. I sat down and found my back very heavy, so I took out your book. I thought I would take a quick look, maybe read one of them forwards. It is an hour later, and I am on page 39. What a treasure. Of course, not all reviews are like that. But I would say that certainly has enabled me to push forwards to make sure that the present generation and future generation will think about medicine as a profession, as a caring profession, as a profession that respects science, that has great regard, that will always support scientific development, technological advance, as we say in general internal medicine, we will be wise users of technology. But we shouldn't forget that we are also humans. And the physicians need the human touch. Need the human touch of those great physicians who have gone before me, like Osler from Canada, Hopkins, and Oxford. But a great physician from UWI, Ronnie Irvin, Cruikshank, Walt Richards, not sadly. So with that, I want to leave you with this, as I pay you some respect, not only uh, to the stuff that I have done, but also a thanks in part to a great philanthropist, Ray Chang, whose vision it was to see that Chang Tier, teaching of internal medicine, Chang Tier in subspecialty uh, for the Caribbean, Chang Tier for uh, education and practice.
So doctors, students, young and old, specialists and journalists, always seek the good in others. Help those less fortunate, heal the sick, and not let even insurmountable difficulties stand in the way of heroic deeds. There is no greater joy than being your brothers and sisters keepers. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Professor. Um, I don't know, I, I think you folks have to recognize or need to spend a minute and recognize what a privilege it has been for us to just spend some time with Professor Open Kong. He's um, a legend. You're actually looking at a living legend. And uh, he's a Caribbean legend, Canadian legend, and really a worldwide legend. And um, we are honored to have been given this chance to spend some time with him. I just want to ask you, Prof, um, isn't it about time we had a Bahamian going up there and benefiting from this Caribbean program at your center? So let's look out for somebody who wants to go up there, who's qualified, and let's get a Bahamian up there. We've had some people who've rotated through the Bahamas. I believe Dr. Carpen went up there and spent some time. He was here for a, uh, a couple of years. Um, he's now back in Guyana. And Dr. Suresh, who um, spent some time here, his wife is still here in the ER. Um, but also we need somebody with a little bit of navel string berry around here. <laughs> so we're going to look into that problem. Well, so we, we do have a method of doing that because the, the Chan Caribbean Fellowship uh, is uh, its vision, its uh, uh, objectives is to train people for the Caribbean in specialist, sub-specialist internal medicine. And we're certainly open to that. Uh, we presently, as I said, have four people actually training there. And uh, we certainly would welcome them behind you. Are there any comments or questions that uh, anybody wants to direct towards Prof while we have it? I think they're in awe of Prof. <laughs> That's it. Oh, we have a gift. <laughs> no, Dr. Christine Chin is going to present the gift. <laughs> it's, much, it's much nicer coming from you no, than it is. Thank you. Oh, On behalf okay. of UWI, I'm going to that to you. <laughs> thank, no, you. thank you very much. I know, I'd like to have the last say, of course, so uh, I just want to say thanks for Christine and for Willie, for Dr. Ramphal. It's been a great pleasure coming back here. Uh, I've been here several times, uh, and it's always been good memories, and I just wanted to make sure that uh, you know that it's, uh, it's reciprocal, that I'm here not as a visitor, but as a Caribbean person. So thank you very much for coming, and being so attentive. Uh, I give you compliments for that. Okay, students. Thanks.